Today we're thrilled to embark on a captivating journey into the world of antiques, art and Sikh heritage with Sunmit Singh, a passionate collector and dealer as well as a talented graphic designer and printer. Join us as we uncover the fascinating stories behind Sunmit's remarkable journey from his upbringing in Kuwait to his move to America and delve into the impacts of events like 9-11 and the global pandemic on his life and career. Together we'll explore intriguing questions such as how Summit's diverse background and experiences shaped his passion for collecting, dealing and preserving antique arms and art, the significance of discerning authentic items from fakes in the world of antiques, the intriguing history of Hermandar Saib and its importance in preserving Sikh art and history. Throughout our discussion we'll also hear about Summit's encounters with prominent figures like Narendra Kapani, the father of fibre optics and a renowned world class Sikh art collector. So join us today as we unravel the fascinating tapestry of Summit Singh's life and passion for antique arms and art. Be sure to stay tuned until the end to uncover more captivating stories and catch a sneak peek of the next podcast episode where we cover another interesting historical topic. Thank you for having me. Um, it's quite an honor looking at the folks that have done this before me. I was kind of like, wow, in terms of my upbringing, really all over the place. I was born in India, but I moved to Kuwait the Middle East when I was six months old. My family had a business there. We were there through the Gulf War in the 1990. We we got to witness that. Some of you folks were probably not born then. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, was, I, was, uh, I was four years old and my mom still talks about uh, that experience. So we went back to Kuwait after everything settled down and it was a two year period. We were not living there. And then we finally moved to America in 2000. And so half of my life was, uh, I would grew up in Kuwait and the other half was in Maryland, which is the East coast, Washington, DC. Uh, so I went to high school, college, uh, started my businesses in Maryland. And in terms of uh, family life, it's just my mom, my brother and I, and we're just regular folks. My mom's a teacher, my brother's an accountant. I'm the delinquent in the family that has no job. <laughs> I've been the uh, I've been uh, running my printing business since uh, I was 19. Uh, I just got into it by accident. I was always into graphic design, and uh, I did some graphic design stuff in high school. And 9-11 uh, happened, and all the gurdwaras here locally were like, oh, is he fly out of Bronia? We need to tell the gore who we are, and who's going to design these flyers? And so I started designing them, and then, I figured out how to get them printed and t-shirts happened. We started our own clothing line, my brother and I, which uh, was, 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 is quite popular called Roots Gear. And then somewhere down the line, we acquired our competitor, Turban Inc. <clears throat> then the pandemic happened. And so all our printing and clothing businesses kind of just took a stop. Um, this was, this is all my non antique related and art related life uh so the printing business was my bread and butter for it's i mean it was up until the pandemic to be honest um uh my last job was in high school and then i started my business when i was 19. insane um this is what i love about <laughs> these podcasts is like i would never have assumed you had spent any time in the middle east let alone lived there for any kind of duration of time um and so obviously i can't just kind of let that slide what, like, what were your family doing in Kuwait? Why were they there? Like, what was the kind of, like, why did, was that move, so to speak, yeah. kind of like, why did that happen? So the Middle East uh, was and still is uh, sort of a place where folks from Punjab and Delhi and all over India go to make money because it's closer to India. And coming to America, Canada, England was not always an option for everybody. So Kuwait being only a two to three hour flight from Delhi, my folks were in the Mercedes Benz parts business because everybody in Kuwait just literally drove a Mercedes. <laughs> and because it was so hot there, I mean, you're talking 50, uh, 52 in the summer normal. And so these cars would, were not meant for these temperatures. And uh, so the the parts business was pretty lucrative back then. I don't know if it still is, but you hear about it all the time. There's a lot of labor workers from Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, India that are always, even Punjab. I mean, there's so many Apne six in, in these Middle Eastern countries doing labor work, starting businesses. But at the end of the day, you're never going to be a citizen there. 
you have no rights there. You're just kind of like a, you're there to make money and then you move on. I mean, there's still people that we know that still live there. They've been living there for 40 years, but they cannot own any property. They are not citizens. Their kids won't be citizens. It's just, and if tomorrow they decide to kick you out, they get to kick you out. <laughs> Mad. And when you say they can't own property, then how do these people, like, so if I'm saying in your case, like how, how would the living arrangements work? Rental. Everybody lives in, oh, in rental I units. See. Yeah. Okay, okay. You can't own any property or land. Unless you're born there. Nope. Unless you're blood Kuwaiti. Okay. Like ethnically Kuwaiti, however you mm -hmm. define that. Well, mad. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. And like, yeah. so what was it like living in Kuwait? I, I think it's uh, it's very similar to how it is in other countries. We as six have kind of faced this model minority complex all over the world where we um, try to be on our best behavior, try to follow the law, try to be good law-abiding citizens so that the the powers like us and are friendly towards us. So the same applied in Kuwait, where they were very racist towards brown folks, uh, whether they were from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, wherever. But when it comes to when it came to turban wearing six, they were like, okay, these guys are good because you know they supply us the the parts and they're they're good people and then they speak our language. Um, but there was a little bit of a love towards uh, Sikhs there from the Kuwaitis. Uh, but at the end of the day, we were still part of the brown, you know. You're still the other. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 So that's what it was like. And then so why did you guys then move to America? Like, So my whole uh, mom's side of the family uh, has been in New Jersey since uh, like 84. I think after uh, the Dharmar Sub attack, they started migrating uh, west and then one after the other, the Masiya, Mama, everybody was here. And we visited uh, New Jersey during the war, the Gulf War. I came here, did a year of school, and I was like, wow, this is a whole other world. They don't, they don't, they take what they are, they need school, you know? <laughs> <laughs> They're really nice to you here. <laughs> uh, whereas in Kuwait, we went to private school, which was basically Indian school. Uh, it was in an Arabic school. And so, the teachers were from India. Uh, the curriculum was from India, and the treatment of students oh, was Indian as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so for me, since I I visited New Jersey, I was like, I want to move here, and I kept bothering my parents forever. And obviously, the immigration process takes about ten to twelve years if you apply for family. Uh, so finally, our number came, and you know, we decided to pack up and move, which was obviously. Not easy moving to a whole new country. And uh, my mom, who had never had a job in her life, started working, started using her teaching education. Uh, so, yeah, it was some interesting times uh, uh, when we moved here. A lot changed for us. I can well imagine. Um, You mentioned that you guys arrived around 2000, and obviously 9 11 happens the year after. Now, for someone who is probably kind of just in like the start of their teenage years, what is it like for someone who's in America come as well? I guess the added complexities if you've just come from a foreign country. So you're yourself trying to get used to this new place. What is it like for you guys? And how has the climate changed over the last kind of two decades? So right when it happened, it was almost like you, for me, this is how I remember it. You went from being someone like me, went from being Aladdin at school to Osama in a matter of five minutes. Everything, like nobody would have ever commented of, hey, what's in your backpack or what's in your turban previously. But the day it happened, we started receiving comments right away in school. And obviously the school security was really nice and called us all in. There was about four of us. Um, Turban wearing six there that, you know, if you need any help, if you're in any trouble, let us know. We're here for you. We understand what's going on. So that helped a little bit to know that we, we have someone to rely on. Things changed. I mean, we were, I remember the, especially living in Washington, D.C., which was like the political center of the country. Every week there was some new event we had to go to, prayer vigils and meetings and interfaith and flyers here and lingo there and I think about five, six years later, I, I personally kind of got sick of it. And <laughs> I was like, okay, enough for educating these gore. If they don't get it, they don't get it. That we have to kind of move on and 
and figure out our own lives here. Um, but I, I, I mean, hate crimes still continue to happen in America and all over the world, honestly. Um, people have uh, spent millions and millions of dollars on campaigns trying to educate people uh, over here at least. But um, I, honestly, I think hate crimes will continue to happen. People are ignorant and will remain ignorant. But we've done our part in America to, I think that's it. We shouldn't continue pouring uh, so much of a proactive campaign into educating America. I think there is a way to do something, and some of the organizations are doing it, where they're going into schools and implementing curriculum. So the, the education starts young. You, It's hard to change a person who's 50 years old and has been racist their whole life or 30 years old. And, and to them, everybody's the same and, and you're intruding. So education starts really young, and I think that's where systematic change will happen, where a couple of organizations in America, like the Sick Coalition, are really targeting grassroots, where it makes a difference. A random question just popped into my head as we were talking. In Kuwait, then, what language were you guys learning and like learning in and speaking? So um, English. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was our primary mode of communication because... My parents knew Arabic, but I was still learning Arabic in school. Um, and it was a combination, when talking to Arabs, it was a combination of English, sign language, and Tutti Futi Arabic. Oh, really, <laughs> jokes? Yeah. I was, oh, yeah, was going to ask, yeah. how did you then like communicate with yeah, everyone else? But that know, makes sense. Yeah, yeah. food. <laughs> I want some of the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we picked up uh, basic words and, and basic communication, but um, it, was, it was interesting. <laughs> I think now, years from... From what I hear, English everybody's pretty fluent in English. Because after the war, there was a lot of American troops going to our world, troops from all over the world going to Kuwait, and there's still a station there. And every American company is in Kuwait, so English shouldn't be an issue there now. Obviously, then we've spoken about kind of everything but the antique side of stuff, right? Yeah. Um. Yeah. So how did you end up down this avenue? Like, because from what you've been saying, yeah. You've ended up in the printing business, kind of your main bread and butter, almost uh-huh. by accident, and that kind of flourished into into kind of yeah, just keeping you kind of afloat, mm-hmm. I guess. What like how did this antique things come apart, and like when did it? When did you realize it was something that you could kind of continue with? So it all started in 2007 when I had finally made up enough money to go back to India and explore and vacation, go with friends, and we went to Anandapur Sahib, picked up some karpans that a, a vendor there was selling and he goes, this is, you know, antiques and, you know, you got to have it. And I was just like, I was just like, oh my God, you can buy this stuff. Like whatever money I had, I was like, okay, I'll, I'll buy it. And uh, we come back home and found out that there was a gun show not far from my house. And it was an antique gun show. And then on the, one of the antique forums that I was looking at about where I found out about the gun show, it said uh, there was a singh coming to do a little seminar all the way from the UK. And I was like, what is going on? I've just discovered some some secret dunya that I had no idea about. It was a singh from England is coming to a, a all-American white redneck gun show here in Maryland. What's going on? So I did two things. One, I decided I was going to go to the show. Two, I messaged the singh on the forum. I said, hey, I live 20 minutes away. If you need anything, please let me know. Like, my house is your house. You need me to pick you up from the airport. And he said, yeah, could, my wife and kid are coming. Could you pick us up from the airport or something? And I said, absolutely. And I'll drop you to the hotel. And so uh, first things first, I, I kind of forced this thing. I was like, you got to come look at my new Shusters that I bought. They're antique and, you know, you're going to love them. And Obichara, like, he was like, he looked at them and he was like, you know, I have to be the bearer of bad news to you that these are like reproduction production pieces that you picked up and uh, I was like oh man are you lying to me like (laughs) that guy said these were antique and that that kind of just started the next day we went to the gun show together he introduced me to a couple of folks and and I bought my first Frangi which was like a 19th century or 18th century sword from a reputable dealer and started exploring and then I kind of got onto eBay and picked up some more fakes because you know they were really good fakes on eBay and 
that the gun show would only come around once a year. So it took me a couple of years after that to really figure out that I had something going in terms of collecting that I wanted to collect. And then simultaneously, when the Gore at the gun show saw me coming so much, they're like, hey, what? who are you? Like, what do you do? Where do you live? What do you do with all these things you're buying? Do you want a table at the show to sell? And I was like, I can do that. <laughs> and, uh, I was I was I was young. I was like, I can set up a table and actually sell. Would somebody buy from me? And so I applied. And uh, back then, it was a pretty tough. Uh, there was a waiting list of four or five years to get a table. And uh, I applied, and I got denied. And they said, you know, you're, we're going to put you on the waiting list. Um, two days before, they give me a call saying someone has dropped out or or something and we have a table available would you like to come i was like yeah of course i'll come there was another gora there he was a, he's still a good friend of mine he runs an auction house he sort of showed me the ropes in the beginning on how to you know do these gun shows what to bring to sell what what to sell what to buy how does it work and i started becoming a regular at this show and then some more shows and I, yeah it's just crazy that and even today it's just one or two things that are at these gun antique gun shows in america not the same when i went to birmingham to to do a show i was like whoa there is a lot of six here that come to the shows exhibit at the shows but it's not the case in america if i was the only thing from america the others came from the uk to america so I think for me it was like wow this is this is a this is uncharted territory in America. It, it's it's interesting to see the difference, but equally I think that's because of also like the UK is far more concentrated. Like we're we're obviously tiny. Like California, I think as a state on its own has a bigger GDP than the whole of UK. Like to put it into context, right? And equally, I think the other thing is, is in the last couple of decades we've seen organizations like Gashi House etc. really kind of push the envelope in this um regard and it's interesting that it's not i like i find it interesting that it's not taken off more in america considering how like considering even like antique firearms would be easier to get hold of like there's just it just seems like the market would is more friendly over there but anyway are there any pieces that you've had in your collection over time that have any particularly interesting stories or anything that you think is kind of worth sharing with those listening at the moment um, there's so many. I think that the whole antique uh, space is on stories. It's it's about the object, the history, and the story of how you acquired it. So the stories are just it's just yesterday I opened up a little package of a painting by Ishwar Singh or Ishwar Singh, signed 1976, I want to say. Uh, and he was from he lived in London. This was the painting he did a few months before he passed away. And I picked it up from an art dealer in Vancouver. And then I found his son, who I think still lives in England. And I messaged him saying, I, I found this painting and uh, please tell me more about your dad. He had made a Facebook page about his dad's career as a writer and as a painter. And and uh, he was just really happy. He's like, how did you find this? Where did you get this? This was one of the last works my dad did. And then... Uh, it was just, it was crazy. I mean, obviously, it's not antique because it's not over 100 years old, but it's contemporary sick art, uh, and it's cool that I kind of like doing a little bit of both. Uh, I have an interest in contemporary sick art as well. So that was just literally yesterday's uh, pickup. <laughs> Do you have, like, a favorite uh, antique weapon, like, or maybe even a piece of armor that you've owned or currently may still own that you're like this is my favorite and any particular reason why i think it's got to be the cane and and reason i'm mentioning it because i've talked to some of the 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 who's who in the in the world of collecting about it so it's not a secret i was able to uh get my hands on maraja dalip singh's uh, cane and the cane was gifted to him by king edward who was prince of wales and so it's got an inscription to varaja dalip singh from prince of wales and i think the story behind that was that 
his uh, his caretaker or maid in the hotel that he was living in in Paris before he passed away. He, he had just given a couple of things to her. And she passed these down. And so these came from her granddaughter's estate. And uh, luckily, they didn't make it to the big auction houses. That's why I was able to buy it on a budget. Otherwise, uh, you've seen the pricing <laughs> prices of things with such provenance. Uh, so yeah, that's one of my... Uh, favorites than uh you know the last king of the sick empire that sounds uh, pretty from bad his final days yeah yeah no that's a sick one and you're and you are right when it comes to these auction houses like the fact that you managed to get hold of it says itself that there wasn't a lot of publicity around it because i've seen things go for like 10 16 30 40 times the price that they're put up for i was watching the summer series by Sikh coalition about preserving Sikh art and history and you spoke about how at the beginning of your journey as you kind of already shared you were duped by buying these fakes since then how do you make sure or how do you spot when things are fake like what is your and I ask this to everyone in this field is like, how do you make sure that you're buying the right thing? Because I've seen some reputable dealers, quote unquote, who have bought things that are definitely not what they're said to be. But like, how do you figure out what's real? And especially when it comes to things like kind of antique art in particular, because that obviously is there's a lot of uh, forgeries. I, I think it, it's hard. It's a it's expensive um, learning experience after making a lot of mistakes. I mean, I had kind of figured out my game uh, in the Shuster world, and then I had diversified my collecting into art, paintings and, uh, you know, miniatures and things like that. And that was, that was a whole another world of forgeries. And I was like, how, how do you tell? Even up until I, f I feel like a few years ago, I was still questioning, how do you tell? And I think the easy way to answer that is the more original stuff you see and handle, the easier it is to identify the forgeries. Uh, the forgeries are getting really, really good. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with reproductions if people are buying copies for the sake of buying copies. But when, when copies are sold as antiques, that's when we run into a little bit of a problem where it's dishonesty. If something is 20th century or 21st century and is being sold as that, there's no problem with that. You know, I'm still working on my my art game and trying to uh, figure that out. But in, I think I feel like I'm pretty comfortable with my arms and armor. But even those in the last few years are just getting, the forgeries are getting better and better. And somehow they end up in really good auction houses and, and you know, it's hard to, and then they end up in books and then, that's factual information now and so it's harder for the younger generation to compare when they're looking at these books and when maybe i can i'm not that old but i can say i was around when that was made and put into the book so it, it's tough i think it takes uh it's kind of like jewelry or gems where you need a guy or you need a person with an eye to figure out you know it's hard to tell a fake diamond from a real one unless you know what you're doing completely and again i've asked a number of dealers and antique collectors on the podcast before pretty much the same question and it's just interesting to see that everyone says the same thing everyone is like actually it's just a process of kind of learning and also it's interesting because you're the second person i've spoken to in this field who's commented on about how fake antique arms and armor recently have been getting very clever in how they fake it have you like have you come across anything in any auction houses that you've been like like, yeah that's definitely not what it says it is yeah i mean it, it happens all the time and i and then you i even end up knowing the folks that buy them and it's a very hard conversation to have because when someone spent a lot of money or whatever amount of money buying something to tell them that this whole thing was just not what you think it was or what you were told it was it is, is a hard conversation to have i was more actively uh, educating people about that but then i feel like it took a lot of my time and energy also nobody likes the bearer of bad news so i've kind of moved on to focusing more on myself and my business and and rather than focusing 
focusing on what uh, other people are doing with with buying and selling. Is what, this is just again my curiosity getting the better of me. Is one benefit of the contemporary art market the fact that there are less fakes? Because the fact is, is like you can actually, I guess, in some cases, check with the artist. Like I know in some cases they're not live, but like would I be fair in saying the contemporary art market is is more legit? Well, what I mean by that is, is as in there's less fakes in that field. As long as the artist is alive, I think the fakes are out of the question. You can always reach out to an artist. I bought a a really large painting uh, that I was able to identify. It was an Iranian artist who lives in Brooklyn, and he is actually exiled for Iran for making works that talk about the oppression in Iran. But I found this at an antique show, and the seller had no idea what it was. But just because I had seen his work, I kind of was like, I have to buy this right now. It's worth the gamble. Because he sells his work for like seventy, eighty thousand dollars, and I'm here at a, a random like a flea market style antique show, and it's a large painting. I mean, about it's taller than me, about six feet tall, and and I'm I'm looking at it, and I'm like, I know this is him. I'm like confident this is him. Why would somebody fake this? And he's alive. But anyways, we paid for it, we bought it home, and, and then I just started figuring out how to contact this guy. Like, how do I get in touch with him? And, and then I found his email somehow through a museum curator and I emailed him saying, hey, I purchased this work. Any chance this was you? And he goes, oh, yeah, I made this in 2003. Like, how did you get it? And I was like, wow, yeah, that's a good <laughs> that uh, I was able to get one of his works. Uh, I still have it. I haven't figured out how to sell it. It's not something I'd like to keep, but it was something I was really, I, I, was, I really liked when I saw it. No, fair enough, fair enough. Now, for someone who's in the middle of the antiques market, as well as the contemporary art market, I'm sure people have asked you this question before. What is your perspective on the idea that everything that had left India has been looted? Because there's this kind of presumption that anything in an auction house, anything that's kind of sold in a marketplace that has anything to do with Sikh history, Indian history, however you want to define it, has been stolen or has been looted or or whatever other term you want to add to that. What's What do you think? What's your perspective? Nothing is black and white. It's not like a one plus one. Yes, a lot of stuff was looted, especially from Punjab. But you have to not be ignorant about the fact that there was artists and artisans in the court of Lahore that were selling their art to the the English or the Europeans that were visiting, the, the families that were there or the officers. There was gifts being given by the Maharajas and the Rajas to officers. There was so much fair trade, you can say, happening. That you know, it's it's uh, it's it's ignorant to say everything is looted, but also, yes, there was stuff that was looted. There's no denying. There's no denying. I mean, it, it bothers me to see Maharaja Ranjit Singh thrown in a museum in England. <laughs> like, I don't know how it got there, why it got there, but that's something I I look at and I'm like, okay, so this is possibly one of our most important 19th century relic that's sitting here okay i mean it's preserved well i i i'm happy about that it's taken care of way better than it probably would have taken care, been taken care of in Punjab. but now that we are we have seek uh, curators and restorers and and folks that are kind of learning the trade we're probably in the next 10 years are going to get to a point where we might be able to take care of such things and not use that excuse that it was better off in the West in a museum because we were unable to take care of it. Um, there's people that are restoring manuscripts, studying how to restore manuscripts in Punjab and in the in America and England. Same with Arms and Armor. I think we've had to kind of catch up, but everything can't be looted. That doesn't make sense. No, <laughs> no, no. Again, just being devil's advocate in regards to Maharaj Adijit Singh Ji's throne. Again, like do not disagree with your sentiment sure. whatsoever i think it's something that everyone listening to the podcast probably shares to be honest like you said it bothers you what like what would the alternative be so like what is the better vision that you would see like as in so i guess what i'm trying to get at is where would you like to see it that it wouldn't bother you i guess 
I guess it, it's the same way you could say the Queen's crown, you know, or relics of England, uh, English royal family history. Where would you like to see those? Not in France or not in Portugal. You would like to come to England and look at English history. So if I was to go to Punjab or Lahore, didn't matter to me, it doesn't matter if it's West or East Punjab. I'm not saying it needs to be in Amritsar. No, it could agreed. be in the Lahore fort or yeah. where it came from, uh, or it could be in Amritsar. But to me, that would be the ideal place where something of this sort would belong okay. or need, needs to go. Unless, you know, there's a story where Maharaja G. Singh picked it up and said, happy you go. <laughs> there's a gift, you know? Uh, okay. Same. No, no, no. I, I don't disagree with that. And just, just kind of pushing the envelope a little bit further. Like, yeah. so obviously Punjab's annexed, it's conquered. We, like, we colloquially uh, lose the war. Yeah. Uh, now, if we were to flip that on its head, and let's say for argument's sake, because I remember reading a newspaper article when the Anglo, from the, like the period when the anglo Sikh wars happened, and it's uh, a British paper. And he's, the, the, the paper is basically saying, imagine if the Sikhs turned up in ships on the coast of England and invaded England. Yeah. Now, let's say hypothetically that happened. Let's say Punjab annexes England and we take the Queen's jewels and we've got mm. them in Lahore Fort, for argument's sake. Yeah. Would, I, I don't think that would bother anybody. Yeah, yeah I agree. I don't think that would bother. Odd, oddly enough, if you flip the, flip the story or the scenario, uh, and there was artifacts like that. I mean, you find uh, things from the Afghan army that are now, uh, so the, the six fought the Afghans and when they won, they took their weapons. When the British fought the six in the Anglo-Sikh wars, they in turn took their weapons. And now you see Afghani weapons that are described as Sikh because they were picked up from the, you know, the Aliwa battle or the Mudki battles because there was this whole chain of uh, transfer that happened. I, I just bring up the throne because of it being so iconic. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, completely. Yeah. Completely. But I, that, I don't think it would bother anyone if it no, was, uh, it was no, the real monarch. It would have. But in, in, in the U.S., the, a lot of museums are, are giving things back to uh, countries in Africa, to countries in Southeast Asia. I know the Asian Art Museum just gave something back. So did uh, the Met Museum, which is one of the best museums in the country, gave back something to Egypt that they purchased from a dealer that they had. Yeah. Well, the dealer didn't steal it. The dealer probably purchased it from another dealer and so on and so forth. But it was vetted and so and so forth and it was exhibited. And then the government in Egypt was like, hey, now, this uh, this was stolen. So I guess... Uh, Moving forward, there's a lot of work to be done in this space, and it's a whole different space. Folks like me that are dealers and collectors are like a, uh, probably a part of this process that can help with whoever is spearheading something like that to uh, identify things and make sure, you know. For the example, there was news all over the internet in Glasgow, muse the Glasgow Museum, I guess that's Scotland, uh, handed some things back, and there was a thing from the Indian government signing some documents and they kept saying this 15th century sword that they gave back from this museum uh, to India. And you could ask any dealer in the arms and armor world, hey buddy, does this look like a 15th century sword to you? And the answer will be no. On a good day, it's a late 19th century sword. And it's it's just, it's nothing, nothing super, like amazing. But I'm wondering who wh who's behind this? Like. Is the museum making a fool of the Indian government or the Indian government making a fool of the people or the media is just clueless? What's going on? Where are the experts? Perhaps in kind of parallel to that, there's a lot of, there's a few websites uh, or like collections, like I think there's Durham University collection. It has a photo of Maharaja Ranjit Singh and they've labeled it as Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji. There's a photo of, oh, I can't remember his name now, but I think it's like Jodhawar Singh or something, one of the one of the guys in part of the kind of the empire. Um, and they've labeled him as Kadik Singh. Like as in, and there's another, I can't remember the other one. There's a, then there's a few examples that I've seen on auction houses where they've listed something as like it being completely incorrect. So I don't know whether it's a bit of the institutions themselves have no idea. And equally, like the people who should know better, like the Indian government in this case, 
don't seem to know better either. So, so I think, because the thing is, is once you normally get in touch with these institutions and say, look, I've had a look at whatever, and actually it's not this, it's this, they're normally really kind of appreciative and like the fact that you've reached out. Yeah. I wonder, it's not surprising to hear it, although I think for some it might be a shock. I think though, once you've kind of seen it or heard about it a few times, you're like, yeah, this, this, this happens. And equally, I think there's a few people in the market who are aware that there is such a demand that they can make money by reproducing all of these fakes and kind of pumping things out into into the right spaces. Now, whilst obviously doing my research for this podcast, uh, I think it was in the same video by Seed Coalition that, that you were part of, that you mentioned you'd had the pleasure to meet Narinda Kapani, who was the father of fiber optics, for those listening who perhaps don't know. Um, he also went to Imperial University in London, uh, which is where he actually kind of invented fiber optics and then took the technology to the US and... Yeah, and then his legacy lives on through his collections, um, which is, I think, how I got introduced to him. What was it like to meet him? And did you get the chance to see his collection? Yeah, meeting him was a very interesting. When I first met him, I was very nervous. <laughs> um, um, I, I didn't know what to expect. I mean, he was in his late, I mean, mid-80s when I first met him. Um and I was I didn't know what to expect. I showed up to his office and they said, okay, let's hang out here. He'll call you up in a few minutes and okay. And so I go up to his office and um, the first thing he says to me, oh, okay, you're Sunmit. And I was like, yeah, I'm Sunmit Singh. I'm from Maryland. And he goes, so you're a collector? And I was like, oh, sorts. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, I collect a few things. He goes, and straight to business, he goes, okay, show me what you have. <laughs> and I said, okay. <laughs> and so luckily I had a folder on my phone of, of pictures of things that I had just, you know, started putting aside as sick art and just everything that was specifically sick related. And, uh, you know, he flipped through all the pictures and I think that's when he felt comfortable. He's like, well, okay, have a seat. So let me tell you, and and that's you know then we talked for about an hour and a half. You passed two. the test, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I, I felt like I passed the test. He told <laughs> me the story about how he got the George Richmond painting of Modern Agenda, and you know his background and all of this, and and then we met a few times after that as well. I think I feel like I met him the year before he passed away as well. It was one of part of the Hazud art and the Sick Art exhibit that happened in California. A lot of the artwork was from his collection. Just recently, actually, I think on my last trip or the trip before that to London, I found something really cool that was his by some random Gora who just had it. Uh, Dr. Kapani started a company in, I think, 1968 when he first started figuring out what's going on with fiber optics. So he got this box with a bunch of like glass slides and it said on the right side from the desk of K uh, NS Kapani and what's in it. And he mailed these out to a lot of different, I think, universities or companies as samples. And one of these popped up for sale and I was able to buy it. I'll make a post about it. I just had yeah, yeah. to <laughs> autograph it. I just figured it's it's a part of uh, history, internet history. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. This was the beginnings where he was sending out these samples and trying to convince companies to invest in him and and uh, learn about what he had discovered. So this is a really, really cool find uh, that, uh, that I just picked up very recently. This is just my own curiosity rather than for the sake of the podcast, but like what's happened to his collection? I'm assuming it's just stayed within his family or something, or has it been entrusted to a museum? So uh, two museums. So the first was uh, Asian art in San Francisco being close to him. He was always donating stuff there. And they've made a permanent gallery uh, in his his and his wife's name where they always rotate. I think he donated about four or 500 objects there. And so they're constantly rotating uh, every six months. That, they've got the turban helmet there. They've got the flag, a whole bunch of gentlemen. Is this the place where they've also got the ring of Maharaj yep. mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen that on yeah. the internet a few times. Yeah. And so the second museum uh, that he didn't get to see, this was after he passed, was in Montreal, where he donated a, a good amount of uh, his works. And then the third is with the trust or the family or a foundation, I guess. Uh, it's been inventoried, cataloged, and is available 
for future exhibitions and museums to acquire, uh, to loan from. How big do you reckon his collection was altogether? Because you said he's donated like four or five hundred. Like, we're big. talking thousands of items then. Big. I mean, he was, he started collecting when, you know, the big collectors today weren't even born. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the right. original collector, I guess, isn't it? He's the OG collector. <laughs> uh, and he's, he he was buying. I mean, he, he didn't know a lot about arms and armor, what I figured after meeting him and speaking to him. But he once he was in the buying circle, things were coming to him. Oh, okay. Yeah, because so, he was buying from Bonhams uh, when Bonhams would just sell things before the auction to people so his stories are just amazing of how he's acquired various things you know back to the the real answer of how i actually felt in when i first met him i remember telling him hey dr kapani you're like you know 90 something years old you've got a hard drive here of valuable information that a young collector slash dealer like me could greatly benefit from. We'd kill for that info, man. Right? Literally, yeah. And I said, so what do I have to do to have access to this hard this drive? Hard drive? <laughs> and he just laughed it off and there was no answer. <laughs> and, and and I think that's my, that's literally my uh, biggest issue with uh, a, a lot of people in the sick community, whether it be in the business world or in the antique world or even in academia, it is the gatekeeping it's very serious. Um, the whole quote about teach a man to fish doesn't seem to exist. <laughs> you know, that that was my one one thing that I was like, oh, I wish uh, I could have trained under you and heard more stories about who the dealers were and, you know, where you got things from or what's a good way to build something. You, you can always learn more. That's my, so uh, I'm in no way, shape or form an expert. I'm still looking to learn more. And unfortunately, you hit like a plateau where there's not enough resources for you to learn from. So you're just kind of messing up and figuring things out. Learning by literally trial by error at that point, right? Yeah. One of the questions, though, that I wanted to get your uh, input on before we kind of wrap up is, and, and I ask this to every anyone actually who's kind of in this space, which is for someone else who wants to enter into this kind of market or space how like what advice would you give are there any do's and don'ts are there any kind of i don't know are there like top five points you might have kind of where you're like actually over the years these are some really basic things that i've learned that would be useful to people starting out i know in america i'm pretty involved with people that want to collect or are collecting unlike the uk we have a pretty friendly sort of community of collectors and dealers I guess because there's not that many of us yet, or I don't know, but my experience in the UK is totally different between the sick collectors and dealers. Whereas in America, I feel like we're so far touch wood, we're still pretty friendly and we're, we're always sharing information and helping each other out. So I've, I've been uh, helping a lot of the collectors that are seriously acquiring stuff here. And what I would, what I tell everybody is everybody should collect. If antiques is not your thing, buy from sick artists, buy art. Um, don't go to Walmart and, and decorate your house with stuff from there. There's something in everybody's budget that can be found with artists, whether it's calendar art, whether it's miniatures, whether it's some sing making shusters, you know, and, and you're supporting uh, artists that are alive because the dead ones don't need the money and you're actually helping a, a sick business thrive and grow. So I tell everybody, collect something, anything, and it's it's something you look back at and you can see your own growth from when you bought your first piece to how you learned so much about what you were buying. That's what happens with me. I buy things and then I'm like, okay, now what the heck did I just buy? <laughs> yeah, now what do I do with it? Where where does this sit in my collection? Does it even fit in my collection? Uh, sometimes if things don't fit in my collection or if I need to buy something else, I, I do sell stuff to some of the collectors here in, in America, but uh, a lot of times it's me learning on the go and I just feel like this, it should be the same. It will be the same for anybody starting out. You will learn on the go as you buy stuff and research it and it's fun researching stuff too. I'm at a point where I decided uh, last year that I wanted to uh, put my collection in a book or books because I didn't want to wait till I was 60 or 70 uh, to publish this this stuff because uh, 
I wanted to be able to look back and see, oh, this is what I did in my thir- 20s and 30s. Now this is me doing it in my 50s and 60s kind of thing. But I have to tell you, putting uh, a book together, it, it, it's it's not easy. I, I can't find the time or the resources or the money to sit down and, and even put it all together. Anytime I find some time, I'll put a few pages together and then I'm like, okay, I got to go back to work. <laughs> this, is, this is not, this is a, like, you need a lot of time and, and, or you pay someone to do it for you, which, uh, when you're spending all your money on antiques, you don't have money <laughs> to, to, to pay photographers and social media, you know, experts, uh, cause everybody's on a different sort of, uh, collecting journey. Everybody's on a different budget. Uh, that's why I'm like, everybody should collect, um, and help preserve uh, people. I think one of the things I said in that Sick Coalition interview was people should preserve some of their family history. And that's the easiest to do. It doesn't cost them anything. It's within your family. Save it. Uh, save it from um, getting ruined or trashed or thrown away and misplaced. Keep it for for the coming generations, whether it's medals, certificate, letters. Uh, it, it's good family history for, to pass on and generally our community has been through so much migration and war that we haven't been able to save these things we were kind of always been on the run whether it's since the 1800s or the 80s we've been fleeing uh to new lands and we've we take what we can with us right yeah and and just to kind of um echo that i pretty i can probably guarantee 90 percent of people listening to this can't trace their family history back more than two or three generations um and again it relates to exactly what you said like even myself um on my dad's side of the family i can only go back to my grandma's grandma and after that it dies and even the information that i have off my grandma for her parents and her grandparents and even on my uh baba side it's literally just names roughly kind of like he might have been born here might have been born there obviously there's a lot there's a lot of information when it comes to when they passed away because it's more kind of clear in in their memory but yeah like as in had that piece of advice that you've given been followed (laughs) earlier i think a lot of us would be able to trace back our lineage a lot easier so no no even i I need to follow my own advice i have (laughs) because nobody in the family cares to do it so i've just been holding on to a lot of information that i need to put together and and just get it verified and checked and formally say this is it like this is the family history but i just haven't been able to get around to it again if I didn't have to go to work, I feel like this is what I <laughs> this is what I would do full time, uh, which is what I which is why I enjoy dealing, because uh, I want to be able to transition from my printing business to being an art dealer, antique dealer full time over the next hopefully two years. Well, hopefully, in by that point, we'll do another podcast at the point that you've made the transition, and we'll be able to discuss about how that happened. And equally, good luck with it all, and and with the book, because I think. Like, it's always really exciting to see other people kind of with similar passions doing their own thing. And I think, yeah, like, I'm I'm excited just to hear you're doing a book because I know there's going to be stuff in there that I will, like, I would love to see. Um, and I'm sure people listening uh, are probably excited to hear about it as well. So, yeah, like, I will be keeping a very keen eye on kind of progress updates about that. And the day I see it on your... On your social media, I will be very, I will be very happy. Um, and I'll obviously share that with everyone too. I just wanted to say thank you. We've been talking for just over an hour. Um, it's absolutely flown by. We've covered all the questions that I had prepared. Obviously, we like just want to check, just double check. There's nothing else that you wanted to cover or anything. No, I think we and should. We're good. Nice, nice. Definitely do another one when the when that puts up. That's motivation. If I need to do <laughs> another podcast, uh, I need to get that book ready. Sounds good. All right, bro. Awesome. All right, take care, man. Bye. So you've reached the end of another podcast episode, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed creating it. If you're interested in exploring more historical topics, be sure to check out our previous episodes. A special thank you to our Patreon supporters, who include Gogan Singh, Yasmin Jaswal, Amadeep Basi, Zamnik Kaur, Rav Singh, Mani Singh, Zamnik Kaur, Anish Man, Himmat Singh, Khalsa, Gurdi Bath, Gurpreet Singh, Jas Dylan, Hernan Pazano, and Neil B. 
And also a special thank you to our YouTube members, Jas Dillon, N Singh, RB, Gary Parmar, GS, Gurpreet Dungeon, Rata Ji Kaur, Hunter Hill, Amand Reed Homme Jeet Singh and Desert Peak Films. All of you help make this work possible. If you're interested in getting involved, find the links in the description below. Otherwise than that, see you in the next podcast episode.